This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. Writer, humorist, and Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me host Peter Sagal is no stranger to St. Louis. Heard by millions across the country, the show airs on St. Louis Public Radio every Saturday and Sunday at 10 a.m. The show has also been recorded on location here. In 2019, Wait Wait's special guest was Ozzie Smith, and in 2013, it was Jackie Joyner-Kersey. Well, Peter Sagal returns to St. Louis for an evening with Peter Sagal this Friday, March 15th at 8 p.m. at the Sheldon Concert Hall. And he's our guest now. Peter, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back, and thanks for the reminder of our prior visits. But now I feel terrible that I'm not bringing a world-class athlete with me this time. Oh. It feels like people expect that from me. Uh, I was just wondering, if Albert Pujols is listening, could you show up? Because, you know, the people expect it, I think. Okay, we'll, we'll put in a word there. Thank well, you. We're going to revisit the time that you ran through downtown St. Louis in your underwear, but... Before we get to that, let's talk. Now that I am going to do again, because (laughs) it's part of my tradition that every time I come to St. Louis, I strip down to my underwear, shave a heart into my chest hair, and run through the streets, because I've done that and it was fun. So most people know you, Peter, and your voice through Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. The, The show celebrated its 25th anniversary last year. So, I mean, 25 years is a long time. Other than a paycheck, what is it that keeps you energized about doing that show after all this time, Peter? I'm sorry, is there a reason other than a paycheck? Because I've just been punching the clock for at least two days. No, I kid, of course. Um, there There are two very, very wonderful things about my job. And the first is, that uh, I come from the theater. That was my background. I I was a playwright, sometimes performer, but that's what I expected to be doing for a living, if I could make one, uh, with this one and glorious life. And instead, I took this very strange and unexpected turn into radio. But for 25 years now, I have been able to do a show in front of an audience every week. Uh, As you mentioned, a couple times now, not enough times in St. Louis. But that energy and that fun and that excitement and, to a certain extent, that danger, because you have no idea what's going to happen in front of a live audience, really is the thing that both terrifies me and excites me every week. Mm-hmm. Um, just being able to get up there and perform with my friends. It's, it, it's not bad. I recommend it to anybody who can manage it. And the other thing is, is something that's th- that I knew about early on, but has really come into focus and become more important to me over the literal decades. And especially if I can say over this last eight years or so, which is how much the show means to people. And they tell me that in a bunch of different ways. Uh, Some people just tell me that, um, you know, times are hard, either in general, you know, reading the news every day, listening to the news, or just in their lives, you know, some, because we're all, you know, heir to all kinds of misfortune. And people come up to me and they say, oh, you know, I got fired, say, and and listening to your show was a highlight during a hard time, or sometimes it's even worse, diseases or deaths. A lot of times people are like, uh, especially during the pandemic, oh, getting through each week was tough, but knowing that you guys would still be there on the weekends making jokes about all this nonsense, uh, helped me get through the week. And uh, and because we've been doing it for so long, I, I routinely run into people who literally grew up with our show mm-hmm. and for whom it was like a family tradition. Um, you know, grown adults in their 20s tell me that they used to listen to the show with their father when their father drove them to soccer practice 15 years ago. And now here they are. Here's my dad, they say. It's his 60th birthday, so I brought him to see your show. And I have no, I, I'm sorry, I cannot tell you. I cannot over-exaggerate. That's redundant to over-exaggerate. I cannot exaggerate uh, how thrilling that is to find out that myself and my friends and my colleagues have meant that much to uh so many people over the years. And now I'm working on the third generation because I want grandchildren to someday show up and bring their grandparents and blame them for forcing them to listen to the show in the car seat. <laughs> well, is there ever any, you know, like a feeling of obligation or responsibility then when you know that there are generations of listeners to, to make the show for them, you know, for it to be something that keeps them coming back? 
Oh, yeah. And and it's not, you know, I mean, there, there's, there, there. I guess there are ways you could spin that as being kind of like, you know, sucking up to the audience and just, you know, trying to find out what they want. But no, I mean, this is public radio, as you know, because we're talking <laughs> on public radio. And public radio only exists uh, by virtue of the grace of the listeners. Uh, quite directly, you know, we've all done pledge drives. <laughs> and, and so we... I mean, there are two ways of looking at it. One way is, yeah, we, we keep in mind what our listeners will want. We keep in mind what they're looking for. And because of that feedback that we've, I've talked about, i.e., you know, you helped us get it through a hard week or you helped me get through a hard, hard time, we know that our role is, as much as sometimes we might be tempted to do otherwise, not to stress how dangerous or bad or depressing things are. There's the entire rest of the broadcast schedule for that. <laughs> but we like to bring people something to laugh about, something to relax about, something to enjoy, something they can talk about at the dinner table without angering anybody else, um, mm. and to essentially give them a break. Now, at the same time, I also have to say that the secret to our success, if there is one, is simply this, that on our show, we just try to have the most fun we can have with each other. I tell that to all of our guests, all of our special guests who come on the show. Uh, hey, you know, there's a lot of things you might want to keep in mind, but the only thing you really have to remember is the more fun you have with us, the more fun our audience has. Mm. So every week, myself, my producers, my writers, the, my colleagues with whom I work in the office, and then my panelists and guests who I interact with on stage, we're all just trying to amuse each other and enjoy each other and enjoy what we're talking about and having a good news yeah. and having a good time, I should say. And uh, we're very, very lucky in that our peculiar tastes happen to match that of enough people that people keep listening. Right. And how is it, Peter, that you know when something in the news is a good fit for, wait, wait, don't tell me? Well, that's a good question. Um, and, and it is something we grapple with uh, every week. And we have some, some, you know, rules of thumb, for example. We never, or we try never, to make fun of anyone who came into any kind of misfortune through no fault of their own. And that is a vast variety. Uh, that encompasses a lot of the news. People who are involved in disasters, natural or man-made. People who are terribly victimized by other people. We just don't want to make any, even come anywhere near to mocking or enjoying ourselves at the expense of those people. Um, we try, and, and this is a personal thing. I find it very hard, personally, to be funny about stuff that makes me angry. That's not true of everybody in my business, but mm -hmm. it is certainly true of me. And and since many of my colleagues feel the same way, um, we try not to do stuff that's more angering than silly. And as you can imagine, in the news of the day, these days, there's a lot of stuff that is rather upsetting. Mm -hmm. and, and we do our best to, to, to avoid that. And again, it's part... Partly because we know there's plenty of that. If, if anybody wants to get upset, oh boy, do I have options for you, <laughs> sure. right? Let me introduce you to this website or this cable TV show. In fact, if I can, you know, branch off into a little media criticism for a second, oh, I think there's a lot of media models out there, uh, all kinds of venues in the media, channels, if you will, who make their money by getting you mad because, mm. because anger, adrenaline, is an addictive substance, and people like it in a weird way. I mean, they wouldn't admit it. They like to be enraged all the time, but it certainly does activate them. And we just want to leave that aside. That's not what we do. So if there's something that we think will make you, our listeners, more angry than delighted or amused or distracted, then we will try to avoid that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we just judge every week. We, we have a room, a writer's room, that we talk about stuff, that we try stuff out on each other. And if somebody's reaction to a news story is, you know, that just really makes me mad. Or somebody, and this is, this is, by the way, one of the great values of having a diverse room. Somebody says, yeah, I understand that's funny to you, but from where I'm coming from and with my experience, that's really upsetting because it reminds me of this or it shows that. Sure. And, and we're very careful to listen to that because, you know, we, we know that not everybody, certainly in our audience, is just like well, for example, me. So we, we, we try to be careful. Our, our rule is, if we could boil it down, is like, is talking about this going to make people happy or mm -hmm. not? And if the answer is no, we think we avoid it. Yeah. And what kind of work has building that kind of culture of healthy critique, what has it required? 
it requires a it requires a lot of things, none of which um, are surprising. I think. Um, for example, uh, I am the host of the show. Uh, I get most of the credit for being the host of the show. It's one of the perhaps unfair privileges of my position. But I don't speak just for myself. Uh, I speak for everybody who works in the show. And I have to be very careful to remember that my perspective is not the most valuable, or it's certainly not the one that has to win out in the end, just mm-hmm. because I'm the guy who's saying the words. I have to be careful. I, 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 I need to represent everybody who works in the show. And I need to also, I, I can't think of a better word, and I wish I could because this word has been somewhat diminished by its use in uh, commercial aspects, but I, I also represent the brand of the show. Mm-hmm. Let me put it this way. We feel a, a, a strong responsibility to make people happy they tuned in, to give them what they want from us. And, and I, I need to remember that, you know, if I'm particularly upset about thing A or thing B, or I'm really fascinated by thing C, I just got to remember that it's not about me. Um, it's about the audience. It's about the group of people who do the show. Um, basically, my job is not, and speaking for myself here, my job is not to provide uh, my own genius and make sure that everybody has a good time. It's my, t- it's my job is to allow a good time to happen. Mm-hmm. I am literally the host, and that's what a host does. How has the, the show helped you to grow in your capacity as a, as a host? Oh, uh, gosh. I mean, one of the things we've been doing, uh, NPR has a program called NPR Plus, where people can become members uh, of this program, and they get extra uh, content uh, for their donations. And one of the things we've been doing, this is why it's relevant to your question, is we've been playing this game called the Wayback Machine, where we invite Mm. a listener to come in and listen to our quiz from 20 years ago. We've been (laughs) on the air that long. We can do it. And we all try to answer the questions that I asked back in, say, March 2004, 20 Mm -hmm. years ago. And one of the side effects or the side benefits of doing this fun thing is I get to listen to myself doing this job 20 years ago. And <laughs> I, I, I am so both humiliated and grateful. I'm humiliated that I was not so good at it back then, and yet people listen to thank you for your patience, and so grateful that I managed to get better at it. I, I think that, you know, wow, I mean, you're in the business, and, and you know that it is, um, it's all about... I think doing our job, you and I and everybody else who's in front of a microphone right now, it's all about being somebody who the audience wants to spend time with. Mm -hmm. And that can be for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, as we've already mentioned, there are people who get an audience to want to spend time with them because they make the audience angry in a way they find delightful. But... Uh, for people who aren't do that, we just have to be somebody the audience want to spend time with. So it, 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 it's a real challenge and something I've, I've worked on for many, many years and I've apparently gotten to be okay at it, to use this very narrow opening, the one that exists between our microphones and their speakers, to get across a sense of yourself that someone who they, again, want to spend time with, somebody who's welcoming, somebody who's interesting, somebody who's gracious, somebody who's kind. And I find the more I invest in that, the more I, I put aside my native urge to be snarky or contrary or, you know, even say mean for comic effect, the better off I am. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what I think I've learned is that you have to be somebody that people want to spend time with. And the best way to do that, to fake that, is to actually be that person. Mm-hmm. So in a weird way, uh, just as I think, you know, there are probably people in this world who've, who've, who've diminished themselves by the role they've chosen to play in the public. I think I've actually gotten to be a better person because I had to pretend to be a better person in order to get people to listen to me. I'm talking with Peter Sagel. He's a writer, humorist, and host of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He's returning to St. Louis this Friday for a solo show at the Sheldon called An Evening with Peter Sagel. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be back shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. I'm Elaine Cha. 
Let's return to our conversation with Peter Sagal, the host of NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He'll be in St. Louis this Friday for a solo show. So, Peter, your presentation at the Sheldon is categorically not Wait, Wait. It is an evening with Peter Sagal. Yes, please don't come expecting to to see Paula Poundstone or Josh Gondelman or Maeve Higgins. You're just going to be disappointed. Believe me, I I wish I could bring them, but there's a luggage limit on the airline and I couldn't fit them in. Yeah, no, it's just me. You know, we've been talking uh, about my radio show and it's great for all the reasons I've told you, but... Uh, there are also some things I like to talk about that aren't necessarily appropriate for the radio show. And this particular evening, I've, I've done a few uh, over the years on different topics. For example, I hosted a show on PBS some years ago called Constitution USA, because, so I became a big advocate for civics education and used mm. to give talks about the Constitution and such. And I still occasionally touch on that, but m- mainly what I'm doing is we, we've been doing the show, as you've mentioned, for 25 years, actually 26 now. We celebrated our 26th last January. Mm. And it occurred to me, you know, I'm an old guy now. I've been doing this for a long time. And one presumably exchanges the years in your life for wisdom. And I certainly feel like I've learned some things about being alive in those years on my own, uh, you know, part. But what have I learned about the world? We've been watching the news and making fun of the weirdest parts of the news for a very long time, for more than, you know, the 21st century so far. And... What have I learned? So that's what this evening is. It's the lessons that I've drawn, not just from my own life, but also from a quarter century of watching people in very prominent places be very, very silly. And what I've learned about the world and what I've learned about politics and people and men and women and all kinds of different things. Uh, and that's what I'm presenting. So you benefit from 20, you know, I'll give you 26 years of hard-earned wisdom in about 90 minutes. That's uh, quite a a feat. (laughs) Yes. I will solve all your problems. I will explain everything. It's very quick. It's very easy. It turns out it's all very simple. You didn't know. You thought everything was complicated. It's not. It's not. It's very simple. Well, one of the things that the promotional materials do promise, Peter, is that you will give us an idea as to what the, the real difference is between Republicans and Democrats. You're yes. coming, you are coming to St. Louis. This has some resonance here. Can you give us a glimpse of what it is you will be revealing? Um, one of, I'll tell you this, one of them is right. But you have to come <laughs> to find out who. Sure. There you go. That's the big difference. One of them is completely correct. But unless you come, I won't tell you who. No, I, I, I you know, one of the things, of course, we have dealt with is politics and uh and yet, I, at the same time, I don't want to get too political. Um, I'm, I don't think I, you're, I'm going to be urging anybody to vote in a particular direction. But I do think that there are, you know, we've sorted ourselves out into two camps in this country for reasons. And I think I can I can have some insight into what those reasons are. You know, the, the basic, um, instead of telling you what I'm going to say, uh, I, I think I'll paraphrase my old and, and much missed friend, uh, P.J. O'Rourke, who used mm-hmm. to like to joke, Republicans don't believe government work and get elected and prove it. <laughs> and he had a he had a similar <laughs> joke about Democrats, which I and believe me, he disliked Democrats far more. But uh, that's the sort of thing we're going to be talking about. Is, mm-hmm. is what's what, what? I mean, I think I can, I, I think I can heal our, our divisions both nationally and locally by by bringing us together, all of us, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, on the one thing that we can all agree on, which is that the other side is terrible. (laughs) You know, can't we all get along just based on that basic understanding? (laughs) I think we can. So as a, as a segue here in the intro, I, I promised that we'd revisit your time in St. Louis. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> specifically when you ran through downtown streets in your underwear and apparently a, a heart shaved into your chest hair. So- I, I mention that because it's true. And in fact, I believe uh, it was the Riverfront Times, if I'm not mistaken, ah. that uh, photographed me and published that photograph to where it can still be found. So if you're if you're up for it and the, you're resistant to trauma, I recommend oh, okay. people look for that photo right now. You will find we'll, it. We'll make that an image in uh, the, the web please, post that we do. Please, so by what all means. is it that brought that about? Why would you be... I don't know. Haven't you ever just felt the need? You just, things are getting a little much. You just feel the need to strip down to your underwear, carve a, carve a figurative drawing into your chest hair and sprint through the streets of St. Louis? Hasn't that happened to everybody? Come on. No, uh, what it was, was it was um, a thing called 
Cupid's Undie Run. Mm. And I am a, uh, a, a am what then and and continue to be an enthusiastic amateur runner and occasional racer. And uh, it came at a time in my life when, uh, l- without getting into the details, I needed to get out of town. Uh, and so I was looking around for something to do out of town, and somebody told me, somebody, a friend of mine in St. Louis, told me, a friend of mine is doing this cool thing. They're doing this race. It's a, it's a fundraiser for uh, a, a, a organization that raises money for a particularly unpleasant uh, childhood disease. And uh, it's really easy. Uh, it's just like a mile race. And I'm like, a mile race? I can do that, you know, hopping on one foot. They said, oh, yeah, but the gimmick is uh, you do it in your underwear. And I was like, okay, you may have mentioned me saying I needed to get out of town, so that didn't seem like an obstacle. And then what happened was, it turns out that the Cupid's Undie Run, then and now, is a very big thing. It happens around Valentine's Day every year all over the country. Mm-hmm. And it does raise money for uh, to, to fight this terrible disease. I think it's neurofibromatosis, but don't quote me. And what I did was I got really invested in raising money. I created a, a fundraising page. And I was like, come on, people donate money, and I'll go run through the streets of... Um, of St. Louis in my underwear just for you. And I got so invested in raising money, I can be a competitive person sometimes, that I said, if you donate $500 to me, you get to decide what I'm wearing. And sadly, someone took me up on it. And what they dictated <laughs> was that I, I wear, I have to remember the details, I had to wear bright red underwear with the words, I think, panties of glory written (laughs) on the back. I had to put on a Cupid outfit, including the wings and the bow, Mm -hmm. and I had to shave a heart into my chest hair. And I had made the deal, right? This this was sacred stuff. So you keep your promises, Peter Sagan. And I had to keep my promise, so uh, I did that exactly as I did. Knicker, I'm sorry, excuse me, knickers of glory, not (laughs) panties of glory. Um, And that's what I did. And uh, I, I want you to know that uh, I actually won biggest fundraiser. I didn't wow. win best costume because, frankly, people had to avert their eyes. I mean, come on. Mm-hmm. But I did win best fundraiser thanks to that, uh, that, that, in part, that wonderful donor who, by the way, and I find this terrifying but true, uh, came to see the show, wait, wait, some months later, and asked for and got the underwear. Oh. So somewhere... There is a pair of my underwear um, with the words <laughs> "Knickers of Glory" held as a valued souvenir by someone, and y- you, to whom I'm very grateful, by the way, if yes. they're if they're listening. Our producer just passed along the photo, and you are yes. indeed, as reported in red and white, um, yeah. boxer This is public. Briefs. This is public radio. People <laughs> expect the truth from us. I would not exaggerate. So you wrote about that Cupid's Undie run in downtown St. Louis in your 2018 book, The Incomplete Book of Running. Yes. And in it, it says, you know, one of the things that you've been known to do, at least in running circles, is to run with groups of people in the places you visit. Is that something yes. that you still do, Peter? It, it is. It's not as much as I used to um, uh, because uh, for a couple of reasons. But one of the things I used to do uh, when I went on the road for Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, is I'd put out a call on the website that I no longer post on, once known as Twitter, for reasons. Um, I'd say, hey, I'm showing up in City X, and then anybody want to go for a run? And I would get a good response, and I would sometimes meet complete strangers, and we would go for a run. Because I found out that, as I write in the book, that is a great way to meet people, because uh, chances are anybody who's going to show up uh, at, say, 7 in the morning to run six miles with you is probably not going to kill you. Mm. Most most uh, psychopaths and serial killers are not in great cardiovascular shape, right? <laughs> uh, that running people are the best people. And also, uh, a run is a great way to get to meet people because uh, you're sort of running along, you're facing in the same direction. Uh, nobody cares if you smell bad because that's sort of the point. Mm-hmm. I- I've stopped doing that mainly because, uh, frankly, it's been so long that I actually know people in most of the cities I visit to. So if there's somebody I want to run with, I can just call up a friend of mine. That's what I did, for example, we were just in Austin, Texas, and I ran with my friend William Greer, who is a visually impaired gentleman, who I ran um, with at the 2013 Boston Marathon, which is also described in that book you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And he and I um, ran that marathon and crossed the finish line moments uh, before the bomb went off. So that's a story. 
did to Tal, of course, that also wow. created sort of a bond between him and myself. Not quite like going through combat together, but certainly experiencing something difficult together. And we've stayed in touch and continue to run together whenever mm -hmm. I'm in Austin. Well, as we noted before, this time that you are making this visit to St. Louis, you've been here several times over the years, and you have not exclusively run uh, in your underwear each time. Generally, generally, that was only once. <laughs> so what are some of the ways that you have experienced this city, and what are your impressions of it, particularly as a Chicagoan? I, I well, yes, well, you mean other than the fact that... Uh, we're better than you. Is that what you're supposed to say? Oh. I'm not a native Chicagoan, so, but I understand there's something of a rivalry between the yes. two cities. Bring your boxing no. gloves as well as your. Uh, yes, I know. No, no. I've, 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 I, one of, I will tell you all that one of the great experiences I've had in St. Louis was many years ago. This goes back more than a decade. Um, Carl Castle, of course, was the original mm -hmm. co host, mm -hmm. judge, and scorekeeper of our show. And Carl was of a generation who grew up when baseball was not on television much and thus people listen to the stations the, the teams that you could hear in the radio and for him growing up in North Carolina it was the St. Louis Cardinals who were broadcast on a powerful AM station so he grew up a tremendous fan of the old you know gas house gang St. Louis Cardinals and was a lifelong fan and so around two, I want to say around 2010 the Cardinals gave him the opportunity to throw out the first pitch at a game at the new stadium oh. and we all got to go down and watch him do it and uh and and getting to be a part of that and seeing carl enjoy that attention and 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 had to live out that dream was in and of itself a reason that i will always be a huge fan of st louis uh, your baseball team and more importantly all the fans st louis fans tend to be really nice <laughs> which is not what I'm used to being from Chicago. At any rate, um, I, I, I love St. Louis to me is, is a great city for some reason. My, I have friends in St. Louis who uh, tend, as many of my friends, to tend to be artists and musicians, um, fans of, oh, everything from, you know, cabaret to jazz music. And because of them, I've, I've, I've gotten to experience some of that aspect of life in St. Louis, which I think is, is great and certainly lies the sort of standard midwestern reputation um i love the city museum is one of my very favorite places mm -hmm. in this earth for the reasons that is everybody's very favorite place in fact uh i have young children again and one of the things i really look forward to do is bringing them in a few years uh down there to try out those slides and other attractions themselves no i think i think st louis like a lot of cities uh in this part of the country is far more fascinating and vibrant and exciting and fun uh, than you know people, shall we say, on the coasts might ever give it credit for it because they don't go there. Sure. And uh, and sa and sadly, and I think this is generally true of certainly true of Chicago as well. So I don't think I'm saying anything disparaging about St. Louis in particular. Sadly, whenever cities like ours tend to get in the news, they tend to be for not the nicest things. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's just having spent time in not just St. Louis, but Milwaukee and uh, Columbus, Ohio, and, and Cleveland, uh, there's so much more going on than, than the sad things that make national news. And I wish, you know, I wish every day the New York Times would say, here's what's great about St. Louis, and tell people about all the things that you and I know about. But that's not the world we live in, sadly. Oh, well, we can be ambassadors in our own way. And... People here will get a chance to experience that when you return to St. Louis. An Evening with Peter Sagal is Friday, March 15th at 8 p.m. at the Sheldon Concert Hall. Peter Sagal is a writer, humorist, and, of course, the host of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody uh, on Friday night. Today's episode was produced by our executive producer, Alex Hoyer. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? 
Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.